You go okay, and we have one person, so I'm gonna let her in and then we can get moving. Hi there, thanks Amanda for joining us. I'll give people a couple of minutes um, and then we will get started. Sure. Yay, Marvin, thanks for joining. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Sorry about that. For some reason, the link wasn't working initially. Oh, that's not great. Um, I hope that it is working now. Um, no one has yet emailed me to tell me that they can't get in. Um, but I'll give it another minute and then I will turn it over to Christine to get started just so we can get this moving. Cool. Good to see you, Amanda. I can see you, Christine. Hey, Marvin. Okay, it is 605. And honestly, I am more than happy to have a super small group, um, since I think you both are relatively high information, which is great. But um, 
this is being recorded, just so you know. Um, Amanda, I don't think we've talked directly before. Marvin, hello, always good to see you. Um, my name is Alex Baca. I'm the DC Policy Director for Greater Greater Washington. Um, we have uh, some money from a funder uh, to hold these sessions. Um, I have worked with Christine to put them together. Um, she's very graciously spent her time uh, putting together these slide decks on how DDOT does what it does, especially when it comes to road safety. Um, I've worked on this stuff for a long time and know that typically people interact with DDOT um, like when it just is a project by project uh, incidents, right? If people are at an ANC meeting or if they hear about a project in their neighborhood, it tends to be uh, about a specific project and people engage with the agency from that perspective. And there's a lot more that goes on. It's honestly taken me a long time to learn, even though this is my full-time job. <laughs> um, and I am excited that we're able to um, bring this content as it were. Um, so thank you both for being here. Hopefully we'll have some other people join, but if not, small group is great because we can have a hopefully robust conversation um, about what's going on and how we, how do that makes decisions um but also you know specific to some of the conditions around road safety and more date um i have generally asked people like on these to like not focus on specific projects but i think that there is some usefulness in the ward level sessions of, to like try to connect like any of your experiences with like stuff that is specifically happening in your neighborhood with the functions of the agency so we have you know, 90 minutes and hopefully we can resolve anything that's, or we're not going to solve all the problems, but I hope that like we can connect some dots for each other. So um, thanks for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Christine, uh, who made like this like totally detailed rich slideshow that I'm super excited about. Um, and yeah, thanks for spending your 6 to 7.30 slot with us. <laughs> thanks. Um... Good evening, uh, y'all. My name is Christine Mayer. I work with uh, the Vision Zero office. Um, and I wanted to, there's a couple things we'll go through, uh, but specific to Ward 8, um, there's some key things that you all should know. Um, so we'll get into that in the Ward data. Uh, first, we didn't cover this in the first time um, in the general session, but um, walk through of uh, sort of a high level budget information that you should know. <clears throat> the ward data, uh, we'll look at ward projects, um, and then who are your points of contact. My uh, colleague, Kelly Jong Olson, will be uh, joining us in a little bit, um, and she'll cover uh, sort of how you can reach DDOT um, in the different ways. Um, so first, when it comes to budget, there's two pieces of, of our uh, district budget. There's a capital budget. Uh, think of these like one-time purchases. This is like you buying your home. Uh, these are things like our buildings, our land and infrastructure that that's district owned, public right of way, things like that. Um, and then other things like our fleet, um, our IT systems, our computers, uh, things that like help uh, help uh, that are sort of like one-time uh, things that that help the district um, run better. Um, I, but again, sort of short-term um uh projects uh that have like a longer lifespan um and then our operating budget so if you think of this um in terms of your own lives so the capital budget is you buying your house the operating budget is you paying your light bill or your water bill um so these are the dc employee salaries uh most of them uh these are public services like education public safety things like that <clears throat> and then our, our DDOT programs um, underneath that. Apologies if you can hear my children in the background. Um, so how this sort of breaks out, this is an example um, from council actually on the screen. Um, it funds the DC schools, that funds the program of public schools, which funds the activity at uh, Langdon Elementary, uh, which then uh, funds a service, so, uh, special education. So that's just like a, a quick example of where operating funds uh, will go. Um, operating funds um, expire at the end of the fiscal year. Generally, you cannot roll over those funds. Um, whereas capital budgets, um, you know, let's say like a project is extended or delayed for any reasons, um, that money stays with that project and can be rolled over to future fiscal years. Um, in terms of budget process and schedule, 
um, this is again something from council, but I added in. So DDOT begins to look at uh, at budget uh, formulation, uh, looks at projects and and program funding requests um, in the summer, um, and that will feed into um, the new fiscal year uh, in uh, starting October first. Um, in the fall, uh, the mayor uh, develops operating budgets for the next fiscal year. Council uh, passes the budget submission resolution in December, um, finalizes performance and budget schedule uh, in January, uh, starts holding hearings, performance hearings and oversight hearings um, to look forward to the, the following fiscal year and sort of uh, try and set agencies up uh, with, with other um, priorities or, or things that they need to do better. Um, and then it goes goes on to there. I won't read every single step, but we are here now, um, where a, a lot of news came out today, actually, about um, our budget um, for for the coming fiscal year, which is FY twenty four. Um, we're currently in FY twenty three, um, and so uh, there's a lot going on between uh, council and the mayor. The mayor proposed her budget. Council made uh, changes and and additions and and um, edits to that. Um, and now it it goes in for um, for votes, and then uh, they will uh, transmit that to the mayor, and she can um, approve it or veto it, and then it will sort of bounce back until um, they arrive at something that is suitable. Um, we're in. Okay, so why don't we stop there for a second? Any questions about that? No, not for me. Okay, great. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Ward 8 data. Um, so in this, I pulled um, data from our Vision Zero website. Uh, this is visionzero.dc.gov. Um, there's our entire update, um, our high injury network, which is the map here. Um, you've probably seen it. If you've looked at the high injury or the, the 2022 update, um, it's in there as well. Um, it just, we changed the colors so it could be kind of an interactive online map so you can zoom in. Um, we've got a safety intervention dashboard um, that goes through uh, what, uh, some of the slides I'll go through later, but it goes through kind of what are the safety interventions, uh, what do they do and explains them or, or tries to explain them in a little bit more um, friendly terms, uh, not so engineering focused. Um, and then uh, it provides updated injury and fatality data and uh, fatal crash follow-up on the website. Um, one key part I wanted to make sure you all knew about is, so this is our fatality and injury crash dashboard. This is all of the data um, that we have going back to, I think it goes back to like 2014. Um, in this kind of public friendly dashboard, um, you can look through, this is a current picture, um, of the district. Um, you can filter it by uh, severity. You can filter it by mode. Um, so uh, bicyclists, drivers, motorcyclists, pedestrians, so on. You can uh, select specific dates um, for these. Um, you can filter by your ward. You can also go down if you're an ANC or you want to look at, at um, <clears throat> key issues in your neighborhood and um, and sort of sort or filter by uh, by just your ANC as well. Um, so this is on the Vision Zero website. Um, you go to the crash analysis tab at the top. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see this. Um, so I pulled uh, some of the data uh, that we had since 2017, uh, just to look back. <clears throat> and these are fatalities by ward. Um, so obviously we've gone uh, up and down in the last couple of years in terms of uh, fatalities overall, uh, but generally most of our fatalities occur in wards uh, two, uh, five, seven, and eight, uh, with uh, seven and eight um, seeing the most disproportionate um, amount of those. So um, generally, uh, so ward eight is here in the dark red, uh, then uh, ward seven is under that. Uh, in the darker blue, um, and so on. So this is why we're really focused on wards five, seven, and eight. Uh, these are the wards that uh, most often experience the highest fatalities um, and serious injuries. Back. So this is major injuries by ward. Um, we are seeing an overall downward trend in major injuries, while 
um, fatalities hasn't been constant. Um, luckily, we are seeing uh, more of a downward trend in, in major injuries, um, but still we're not at zero. So we've got a lot more work to do. Um, so again, words five, seven, and eight tend to, to um, bear the most uh, of these uh, major injuries. Um, and then one of the reasons we think we're seeing this big decrease is MPD um, slightly changed the definition um, of how they're categorizing a major injury um, in the data. So that may affect um, how these numbers are looking. Uh, but barring that, um, overall, the downward trend is somewhat hopeful. Uh, it's just not as, um, as downward as we'd, as we'd like to see. Um, so by, by uh, mode, uh, mostly we see uh, crashes with people driving um, and people walking um, in, in wards, uh, ward eight. So uh, last year we had uh, two people killed while they were walking, um, two people killed um, that were inside of a vehicle um, and one person uh, on a motorcycle. Um, major injuries, uh, similar, uh, we see a few bicyclists um, in our minor injuries, um, and we had one major injury with a bicyclist, um, 17 major injuries with pedestrians, um, <clears throat> and then most of those are uh, motor vehicle um, occupants, which is like drivers, um, passengers, um, and in this case, uh, major injuries also includes motorcyclists as well. So, in looking at this data in our 2022 update, um, we developed a high injury network to see what are the highest priority um, pieces of the street network in each ward and district wide um, that we should look to for projects, um, for safety projects and interventions um, to really make the most difference um, in all these neighborhoods. And so um, for ward eight, that's Southern Avenue, um, especially, so the darker red is like the most injury uh, dense and severe uh, portions of the street. So Southern Avenue, uh, Minnesota Avenue, Good Hope Road, uh, slash Marion Berry Ave, if uh, once that, uh, you know, is rolled out. Um, Alabama Ave, um, South Capitol Street, Firth Sterling, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, and M Street Southeast Southwest. Um, so getting into projects, uh, some key things to know. So first, how a project becomes infrastructure, just kind of a refresher. Um, I talked last time about phasing in corridor treatments, and this is kind of what I meant by that. So uh, we may start on a corridor doing uh, single intersection or segments uh, with limited treatments, um, looking at a specific issue, location, uh, crash type, um, and put in some safety countermeasures for that crash type specifically. Um, then we monitor and adjust those as necessary. So that's sort of the spot treatment phase. Then there's like a corridor quick build uh, generally that we like to look at. So that's a segment and whether that's a bicycle project, a transit project or a safety project that may include both um, or just pedestrian safety. Um, we look at, at that at, at a corridor level um, at the crash history um, and determine what treatments we can use for that quick build. We don't tend to move the curbs um, for these <clears throat> so that we can do them quickly um, and don't have to rely on a lot of civil engineering to um, you know, address drainage and things like that. Um, and then we monitor and adjust that as necessary. Um, then oftentimes that will fold into um, a major capital streetscape project. Um, these are things like uh, the Alabama Avenue study that's going on right now. It's like a longer term, um, higher budget. This is moving curbs, making things like really nice and brick and granite, you know, all of all of the, the treatments that, that you typically get uh, with a, a streetscape project. Um, and so these, you know, there's uh, public outreach and, and engagement that happens throughout each of these uh, generally. So quick delivery projects, kind of like that that middle uh, piece we just talked about, um, those happen generally in about two to five years from start to finish. So in terms of planning, we look at the existing conditions, um, especially crash patterns, uh, traffic conditions, things like that. Look at some concepts for that, analyze those concepts and, and the traffic impacts of those, um, if there are any. 
um, do some preliminary design and, and engineering of that, and then outreach is included in that. Um, then we have to, because all of our money, or a lot of it is um, federal money, um, because of the process, we have to document environmental, um, any expected impacts um, to the environment as a result of this project. Um, we have to propose mitigation measures. So this is like, um, there's a, an official process called NEPA, National Environmental uh, something, something. I'm forgetting yeah, it right now. Thank you, Protection Act. Um, and and so this is sort of a shorter condensed version um, of the big project, the sort of um, streetscape projects uh, typically go to. So this is just documenting those impacts. Then we go to design. Um, we get survey of the street from curb to curb, make sure we have the space that we think that we have, um, look at where the locations of manholes are, and then design plans to um, like 100% constructible uh, plans. That's when we will issue a notice of intent um, to the ANC, and then the ANC has the opportunity and the public has an opportunity to comment um, on the project. Um, after that initial planning phase, this is sort of the, the design phase uh, comment of that. Um, after that, we go into construction. Um, so that's, there's a lot that goes in, into the construction of that, but um, sometimes we'll have to uh, go through procurement at the beginning of this process. And procurement is, again, asking for cost estimates and deciding who will do the work. There's a whole formalized process for this uh, to make sure that everything is done um, ethically and, and um, according to our processes uh, that have been established. But, um, but a lot of times we have contracts that um, we're able to pull from that are in kind of like an ongoing uh, task so we can save some time in that regard. Um, and then for capital projects, this is much longer. Uh, there's more procurement involved. Um, they can take up to 10 years, sometimes more, uh, depending on uh, on a few uh, key parts of this. Um, but generally, there's there's more to those those steps. I went over this a little bit in detail in the first round. Um, but the part that can really um, delay things are is the right of way. So like uh, Shepherd Branch, for instance, we've been trying to buy the land uh, from CSX or, or Norfolk. I think it's CSX um, for a while. Um, and so sometimes just negotiations can take a really, really long time um, for that. So in terms of DDAP projects, um, there's proactive, which are our uh, citywide programs, our mode focused programs, uh, our bus priority, bicycle, uh, pedestrian, uh, corridor focus. Um, and then there's localized plans like our uh, safety mobility studies or livability studies. Um, that you may know them by. They're safe routes to schools as well. Um, and then infrastructure projects um, to look at corridor-wide treatments um, or intersection-based ones as well, uh, just to look at the intersection uh, geometry, how the streets are coming in, um, whether there are safety improvements we can make to that. Uh, so those are the more like proactive side. Then there's maintenance, which is just, you know, just like it, it is, you know, maintaining the streets, the bridges, um, our paving markings, our signs, you know, all of these things, uh, making sure that, that they're all uh, sort of maintained um, as, as well as we can. Um, and then there's responsive uh, projects. So these are spot treatments, like uh, after a fatal crash occurs or a critical crash, um, we'll, we'll go assess the site um, and do some spot treatments if it's not part of a bigger project. Um, or there are also requests, so council requests, um, TSIs or traffic safety inputs, um, and then maintenance requests. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit later as well. So um, you might hear a lot about complete streets. Um, so complete streets are streets that move people by accommodating all modes of travel safely, comfortably, and conveniently in interconnected networks. Um, so I like to think of complete streets are vision zero in action. So these are the designs of streets um, that accommodate more people um, than just people inside of cars or vehicles. <clears throat> so they include uh, sidewalks, accessible ramps, 
um, level paved places for bus riders uh, to get on and off the bus, uh, places to wait in the medians or median islands um, to, to cross the street, curb extensions, bus bulbs, uh, bus lanes, more uh, things with that. There's lots of tools in the toolbox. Um, marking on the pavement, having that dedicated space uh, for different modes, uh, markings on the street, whether that's crosswalks, uh, stop lines, traveling markings, uh, things like that. There are signs to warn people um, that someone's crossing, flashing beacons for crosswalks. Um, and then there's signals and signal timing um, that can be done for pedestrians, uh, hawk signals uh, you may have seen around the district. Um, and there's, there's more to that also. So since we're talking mostly about safety, um, I wanted to sort of go over some common safety treatments that you'll see, um, but first, how do we determine what goes where? Um, well, first we wanna know what the problem is. Uh, with resident input and we look at data, uh, we wanna hear the concerns that are going on and determine what the root of the issue is. Um, so if your issue is a pedestrian crossing uh, in the middle of the block um, and you ask us for a stop sign, that's not really the treatment that you would want. Um, there are other things that we can do to improve the crossing um, in that case. Um, then we collect data about the location. So we look at street view images, we go out and visit the site, we look at traffic volumes, at speed uh, data, we collect speed data, uh, we'll look back at crash data and see if there's any history of crashes. Um, and then we look at the street characteristics, um, like the geometry, the curb to curb width and things like that. Um, we'll look at the context of that location. What, what's the street type? What kind of buildings are around it? What land uses are around it? You know, if there's a school adjacent to it, um, what's existing on the street? And then uh, we'll recommend and apply those in engineering best practices. Um, and these are best practices established by <clears throat> the US industry. Um, there's a lot of stuff that is really cool that happens in other countries, um, but unless it's approved by our federal uh, partners, um, we or we get an, an approval to experiment, uh, usually um, we're not able to install those. So these are our standards and guidelines. I went over this a little bit in the first time, but uh, just as a refresher. So uh, we've got federal design guides uh, and standards that we go by. Uh, there's state uh, design standards and, and guides uh, that we refer to. <clears throat> and then there's localized. Um, so if there's a livability study, if there's a, a um, kind of urban design uh, guidance from the Office of Planning, um, then we have mode specific uh, design guides. So a bicycle facility design guide and a, our bus priority uh, toolbox. So in terms of traffic safety, uh, first is vertical deflection. You've probably seen this everywhere. This is a, this is a technical term, but these are speed humps. Vertical mean, you know, meaning it's physically raised off of the, the level of the street. Um, and typically these are done <clears throat> to address speeding issues. Um, so, raised intersections, uh, speed humps, speed tables, raised crosswalks, things like that. Um, then there's horizontal deflection. So that's anything that makes you have to sort of slow down and go around it um, if you're a driver. Um, so these are things like curb extensions, uh, median refuge islands, uh, left turn traffic calming, traffic circles and roundabouts, um, in-street pedestrian signs, if you've seen the like paddle signs, um, sometimes parking as well can serve as that. Um, and then uh, forced turning islands, uh, things like that. Access management. So this is looking at restrictions or reconfigurations of the way that the street um, is accessed or operates. Um, so that's turn restrictions, um, hardening a center line through um, an intersection where we've had a lot of crashes. Um, so that people have to actually go around the block rather than make a left turn there, um, median barriers, things like that. Uh, visibility enhancements. Uh, these are signals, lighting, uh, signs, uh, anything that helps uh, let drivers and others know that there are other people, you know, to expect other people um, using the street um, or crosswalks, uh, things like that, that are uh, coming up. 
there are signs, um, which I mentioned before. So your typical uh, speed limit signs um, are in street signs uh, that we we often, the ones in the middle here, uh, install kind of in the, the center line uh, to let people know that, that there are people crossing. Um, and then uh, wayfinding signs or, or restriction signs. So left left lane must turn left, or right you know right lane must turn right. Things like that. Uh, pavement markings are just painted lines on the street um, that guide people how to use uh, street space. So bicycle lanes, um, parking boxes, shared lane markings, rumble strips, um, high visibility crosswalks. Uh, painted curb extensions like you see here in the center, um, <clears throat> and then painted medians as well. Um, most of these, or if not all, should have uh, our friend over here is uh, putting down these reflective beads um, so that they're visible at night as well. Um, then there's intersection treatments. So safety treatments at intersections that help reduce or uh, or handle uh, conflicts between street users um, a little bit better. So um, there are curb extensions, again, median islands um, or separators, um, no turn on red restrictions, um, stop signs uh, in some cases, or, or adding a signal there as well. Um, changes to signals. Um, so that's a, a safety treatment that we can do. We can add, um, adding a signal where it's warranted. Again, it's it's warranted depending on if it passes certain uh, tests, usually um, as established in those guidelines. Um, there's signal timing modifications. So looking at how long all of the signals at an intersection stay red, for example, before the next um, the next people get to get the green light and go straight. Uh, we can look at that. We can look at how long the yellow light um, stays on. We can look at um, <clears throat> whether left turns um, get to go at the same time as the crosswalk or can be separated from the crosswalk. Um, so these are all kind of things that um, that we look at. Then there's leading pedestrian intervals. This is where you get a head start um, over turning and through moving traffic. Um, and we have those at about 90% of our, our signal uh, intersections in the district. Um, then there's our automated enforcement. These are uh, red light cameras, uh, speed cameras, stop sign cameras, and now uh, bus lane cameras, uh, which will help enforce the, the dedicated bus lanes um, and bus stops to make sure that, that bus service and bus riders um, get a better experience. Um, so we deploy those across the district. We publish where those locations are. Um, it's on the web. And so, you know, people know about them. Um, they are, they are out, uh, out there. Um, then the, finally, there's our safe routes to school treatments. Um, so these are specific around schools. So there's schools on signage, uh, speed limit reductions during school hours, um, pavement markings. We often have crossing guards or traffic control officers, uh, people who are there during pick up and drop off, um, specifically to help uh, kids get around uh, safely and get to school safely. Um, there's other safety measures um, that I mentioned previously. So we might do raised crosswalks. Um, we might do turn restrictions. We might, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do around schools along with all of these other um, things to improve safety. <clears throat> so how do we determine what goes where? The context is really key. Not every countermeasure I mentioned is possible for every street or intersection type. Uh, we do look at nearby facilities like schools, uh, senior centers, metro stations, things like that uh, to, deter to determine which countermeasures we choose. Um, and then street type land uses, move DC mode priorities, crash history, all of that um, is part of the story. Um, one key program I wanted to mention is our annual safety program, or what we call ASAP. Um, every year, there's about 100 locations where we do some kind of safety um, intervention. And this is planned within that year, installed within the very same year, or some of the quarter projects may take a little bit longer. But um, <clears throat> so generally, there's uh, 25 to 35 high injury intersections that are not otherwise covered by a project. Um, this is where we're looking at specific crash patterns um, and trying to uh, select countermeasures 
uh, that are like that. This dashboard is also on our website under the engineering tab as well. Um, livability study recommendations, we picked 35 of those across the district um, and try and advance those. Uh, those were pre-selected through those livability studies. They had outreach done on them. Um, so with those, we're just trying to uh, design and implement what those, uh, those studies recommended already. Um, we tend to do one to two uh, corridor safety projects. So um, for uh, Ward 8, I'm working on Good Hope Road from Minnesota Avenue to Alabama Avenue. I'm looking at, uh, at safety improvements there uh, to reduce speeding and things like that. Um, we do pedestrian crossing improvements with this program, uh, speed feedback signs, look at speed limits that may be higher than they should be, um, different things like that. Then we've got medium to mega projects. So these are corridor level uh, capital projects or, or local uh, sort of quicker build projects <clears throat> that can feature some of the interventions uh, that I mentioned, also like holistic changes uh, to the streetscape, <clears throat> adding you know, uh, nice placemaking things and, and street lights and, and other things like that. Um, so they can be uh, corridor level road reconfigurations, uh, like reducing the number of travel lanes, adding bicycle facilities, uh, like you see on Irving here over by the hospital. Um, they can be bus lanes or they can be these kind of major bridge projects um, or replacements uh, like the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge. So we have a dedicated capital projects page um, and that you can, um, you can filter it by ward um, or by, uh, I think that you can look at a map, so each of these little lines is something going on in Ward 8. Um, a lot of them are paving, um, these little kind of red and green lines you see. Um, but then the bigger ones, you can click on that line and it will tell you what the project is and take you to like another web page uh, where you can look in more detail. Um, then if there are specific projects like the ones you see here, um, Alabama Avenue, Martin Luther King Ave, uh, different things like that, you can also go in and, and look at those uh, projects as well. Then there's our bus priority projects. Um, so capital projects are more general, um, streetscaping. Uh, they might have uh, some improvements for each mode. Um, bus priority projects are specifically about um, bus treatments and improving bus service uh, within the, the corridor that, that the buses travel. So. Um, active projects right now, um, M Street Southeast, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, Minnesota Avenue, um, and Good Hope uh, from Pennsylvania to, um, uh, to Martin Luther King slash 11th Street Bridge. Um, so there's pieces in, in Ward 8 for uh, bus priority as well. Um, for bike projects, uh, most of the bike projects we have in Ward 8 are trails. Um, but there's one um, up here on M Street uh, coming, um, and that's from about half to 11th Street Southeast, um, looking at a protected bike lane there. Um, then we have a whole dashboard of completed interventions. Anything we've done in the past, I think, five years will be on this. Um, so this is all the leading pedestrian intervals in the district. Um, and each one of these it's a little bit small, sorry about that. This is again on our website, on the engineering tab, <clears throat> and you can filter by what you wanna see. So you can look at stop signs, you can look at um, HSIP projects, which is our highway safety improvement program. These are the high injury intersection projects uh, where those have happened. Um, those are all in this dashboard. So you can sort of filter by whatever you want, um, including your ward. So you can filter by your ward over here and then where, where's the leading pedestrian intervals um, in your board, things like that. Um, and then I will turn this over to Kelly Jong Olson and she'll uh, cover who you can reach out to. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kelly Jong Olson, Community Engagement Manager at DIDA. Sorry, I joined a little late. So if I miss an introduction, I do see few commissioners, Commissioner Bill, Commissioner Hamilton. So I wanna talk about who, I mean, Redstone, community stakeholders, you know, uh, civic leaders, AIDS commissioners, where you guys can reach out to for DDA or any other DDA, um, 
these government uh, uh, partners. Okay, next slide, please. So first of all, I want everybody to know who their ANC is. You know, ANC stands for Advisory Neighborhood Commission. So, I mean, of course, we elect council members for their ward, but ANC commissioners are from your neighborhood, right? So they are, one ANC commissioner is representing one single member district, which only include like only a few blocks, you know, so it's not big. They are really from there, the area, they know the people. So we are really rel uh, rely on ANC's voice because they are representing the the area uh, the area and people's voice. And yeah, definitely people can find ANC commissioner uh, from their ANC website. So it is organized very well by word. Uh, you can also search by the search function. So you can see their phone number, address and email address and their title as well from the ANC commission. And also ANC commissioners, I'm sorry, they pass resolution through their monthly meetings. And uh, then those official resolutions can be found at resolutions at ANC.dc.gov website, which is a uh, DC government website that ANC's commissioners um, post their uh, letters and DC government agency have access to all those letters. Okay, this is my team, DDOT's community engagement team. So we have dedicated one uh, specialist per word. So we started very small. We started like two, three uh, outreach staff, and now we have full team of A. So one person, one staff member is representing one word. So for word A, we have Sierra Bodrick. She's actually a senior, one of the senior community engagement specialists. So she's been uh, with DDA for over three years and she's from word A and she really cares for uh, word A community. So she is kind of your main, like, first point of contact for DDA because you know it's kind of hard to keep up who should we reach out for like this project or that project or paving issues. So always Sierra and my team is the first like gatekeeper, you can reach out and we will make sure to connect you with the right person and get you the right answer. Okay, so we are, we're not, not just talking about DDA because sometimes people reach out to DDA for non-DDA issues. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. For example, um, Commissioner or resident may reach out to us and say, hey, can you help us with parking enforcement? Even uh, though we are not doing parking enforcement, it's done by DPW, we are always connecting resident with the right uh, three-on-one uh, category or MOKERS, Mayor's uh, Office of Community Relations Services team, because they are like mayor's liaison with the community. They are um, connecting people with right agency. I mean, if we know the answer, we we also connect them to like, you know, the agency point of contact directly too. But also we we want everybody to know that Mokers are awesome and they are also out there in the community. If you have any like questions that that's maybe more complex than DDOT issues, you can definitely um like reach out to them for more information. Okay, so how DDOT works with ANCs? As I mentioned, ANCs are like official voice of the neighborhood because they're elected official, right? So uh we are we believe that they are neighborhoods official voice. So when ANC passed resolution letters for uh, about D that certain proposal or safety improvement, we review those letters and their comments with great weight, which is required by law. So we want to make sure that ANC understand what we are trying to do to make some changes in the area and so that they can help us um, understand what community wants. So collecting like feedbacks and things like that. So we issue notice of intent to the ANC, which is also posted on our, uh, our public website and resident everybody has access to, but we mainly reach out to ANC to make sure that they can share with their constituent as well. So which uh, offer a 30 day commenting period. So notice of intent, NOI has the very detailed uh, plans for DDAS when we propose certain uh, safety improvements in the area. And we offer 30 days so that ANC or any resident can uh, provide any feedback. So after uh, exp uh, notice of intent is closed, we review all the comments and determine, uh, I mean, make basically decide on the final decision and move on. Uh, 
the last bullet point, sorry. So we are working very closely with ANC. So we hosted one virtual open house earlier this year, and we're actually hosting an in-person open house for ANC commissioners this Saturday. So if you haven't uh, RSVP, please let me know. I can definitely uh, make sure to add you. Okay, so 311 is a government uh, website, but as you know, DDOT is part of the DBC government and we definitely use 311. So if you want to request certain DDOT services, you can definitely go to 311 and you can search, like, for example, you can like search parking enforcement. You will find out that parking enforcement is under DPW. If you want like road paving, you can search for like road paving. You will find out that that's like DDOT. And all those service quest numbers under 311, it is connected to our internal system. So we can track and follow up on those all three on one requests that are under DDAT. So these are one of, uh, uh, let me see, not everything is DDAT as you can see. So one of the example uh, uh, that's highlighted on the, the slide is street and um, street lights. Street lights definitely under DDAT. So as you can see, there are so many government services you can um, request through three on one. And like mayor's team and this, this government like in general, we are really pushing for uh, 301 because we want to make sure where, uh, which area needs more like services, right? Because we also based on uh, the data we got from uh, our team, I mean, especially for data services, we uh, realized that we're seven and eight had like lower usage of 311 and we're really encouraging everybody to use 311. I mean, there's website and also a uh, phone app and also you can just call 311 to request, but, but make sure to remember your tracking number so that you can reach out to DDA with that tracking number. That way we can like search quickly and get your status update as soon as possible. You can also find your status through uh, 311, but it's pretty simple under like 301 website saying it's still working or, or closed. But if you want details, definitely reach out to DDA for DDA services. We can get you more detailed status for your tracking number. Okay, the lastly is a traffic safety input is part of 311 at is, is it, this is off, offered as data services. Also, well, I think one of the most used and most popular um, like program on their DDA because whenever a community member would like to request some safety related improvement, this is the way they can request. You can go to 311 website or call 311 and ask for a traffic safety input. So we also have public facing uh, a dashboard, as you can see. So you can use multiple tab and see where your service request is. You can use filter, use for word. Even you can use your ANC for filter. And I, we recently added SMD filter. So, you know, ANC commissioner, you know, you, if you want to focus on your, your own SMD, you can definitely use the filter to see what's going on, on your, uh, in your SMD. All right, this is all we have for today. Any questions? So I have a few questions regarding a TSI that I inputted, in, and I'm sorry, my name is Amanda Bill, I'm commissioner in 8C08, which is Congress Heights um, in Douglas. So I'm, schools take priority as or they're they're important and i've been making requests about the safety of pedestrian uh pedestrian safety of uh, surrounding turner elementary school and i haven't been getting good responses um so do you mind if i share my screen really quickly okay so oh, hold on baby Oh, disabled. Those are working now. Oh, no, I gotta wait for you. Hold on, let me, I need, think I need to make a co-host if you don't oh, mind. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on, baby. Sorry. Okay, you should be good. Okay, so just to give a little bit of really quick background, there is um, this is my email to whoever Regina is at the. She's safe up to school team. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I wrote to them and I submitted a TSI about my request for do not enter signage during certain times of the day, whatever, because of the traffic congestion, uh, the speeding down Alabama Avenue, and then the parent drop-off stuff. Her response to me was that BDOT doesn't do do not enter signage anymore, which is incorrect because another side of town recently got one. And then she said that there was ample space I'm still asking for review. I asked her, I, I sent her this. I did not get a response from her. I want to be part of the TSI so that I can properly explain to my constituents why certain services are needed. But I'm not, I don't feel like VDOT sent anyone out during the school times just because yeah. of correct information. So then I sent her a follow-up email with DDOT stats that shows the drop-off pickup point at the elementary school is a dangerous intersection. I have attached pictures of accidents that happen on a regular basis, right? That's the elementary school right there. That is where children cross the street. And again, Miss Gina has not responded to my request. The school year is ending soon and a TSI needs to be done so that we can prepare for the next school year but Got I feel it. like yes. I'm getting ignored um and then like I said she's saying there is ample space no one from DDOT came out and possibly saw Stan Alabama and thought hey this is ample space it's horrible it's a horrible place to drop off there's a bus that turns from Alabama to Stanton Road that often gets stuck. I sent her a picture of that too because people park in the bus lane. And so for me, this is prevention. We already know people are getting hit here. There are many hit and runs that are, that are not documented because these are people without insurance. And I can't get a decent response from DDOT on how to keep these kids safe going to school. Thank you. A few it was things. like tooth and nail to get TCOs there. And so I attended a meeting with the director and Sierra was there too. And it took that meeting to finally get TCOs at this intersection where people can barely cross. So they added, I think they're called the Hawk Lights, but I've just, I can sit outside any day of the week and people do not stop for people crossing. They have apartments here and on the other side of the street is the elementary school. And a bus stop that services the W4 and the 92, which are major bus lines. Okay, I'm done sharing. Thank and you. I just wanted to, um, you all to see my email and that I have been reaching out for DDOT about the school. Got it. I just shared my email address on the chat. So can you forward that email to me so that I can follow up um, and also review in detail? I mean, a few things. I mean, the reason that we are no longer doing those hey, hey. Um, no, do not enter, it's mainly because it's not very effective, you know? So time, like, you know, we know that there are existing uh, signs, maybe some other part of the DC, but they are not very effective. That's why also enforcement is almost impossible, right? Because somebody needs to be, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. To be there. Yeah, I have told you. Yeah, so yeah, somebody needs to, they, that's why we are not trying to do this, but that's why when you submit TSI, I want you to focus more on the issues. That was great. You said it's not safe to cross the crosswalk, right? Maybe the do not enter a sign may not be the right solution, but if you can provide more detail on the, what the issue is, which you already provide through email, so we can definitely like look that up so, so that engineers can focus more on the possible solutions based on the issues instead of, you know, resident and commissioners like suggest certain uh, treatment. Because if you suggest one treatment, we can just look at the treatment and say, oh, it's not feasible and then move on, which is not, which is not fair. So Definitely, I'll take a look and then I'll follow up internally and see what's going on. And just to be really honest and transparent and clear about TSI process, it is correct that, you know, the school zone will get like like more points to get prioritized. However, until the location is prioritized, it's, it's not really, we cannot really do actual like investigation. However, as you know, we have like say for the school, they can maybe do some quick fixes such as a sign improvement, based on the existing condition, not like new things, right? For example, if you want some changes that requires engineers review, that cannot happen without TSI. So that can take time. However, I can review your email and see if there's anything else we can do just to alleviate the con uh, condition like in the meantime, until your location is selected for TSI. 
Okay, so according to her, the CSI was done. I just don't believe it. It was, I, I truly believe someone Googled the map and took a look at it and made an assessment because an in-person assessment at the times that schools in session would give a, give a clear view. Like I could literally record and do it myself. I see. And I think for me, I just want an honest investigation of an intersection that DDOT has already been dangerous. Yes, so that's really going to happen once the location is selected for the TSI. We understand we get, you know, some feedback about they feel like my location is not selected. You know, I, I understand the frustration, but we do believe in this new process, which are heavily, I mean, not only depend on those uh, objective, you know, safety factors. So I'm pretty sure this location will be selected in the future. I mean, in the near future based on the, you know, conditions they have. So until then, we can follow up well, with safe route to school and see if there's anything else we can do in the meantime. Okay, thank you. So I'll forward you that email, okay. but the most thank what I want is just someone to respond and convey that, but not tell wow. me that you can't do something. You know, just like yeah. you've done what you did. Yeah, got it. Thank you so much. Um, I was actually going to ask a follow-up question just as a hypothetical, like, and Christine, this might be more of a question for you is like, in lieu of a do not enter sign, like what is a, what changes behavior? Like what, what would actually prevent that from, like from people speeding and ramping up the curb? I think this is like, I'm just not promising that this treatment will happen, but as a hypothetical of like, what is the the right approach here? Yeah, for Alabama Avenue, so we, we have a long-term study for Alabama Avenue, but um, Alabama and Stanton, um, like Commissioner Beal pulled up, is is definitely a high-priority location. Um, so if, if speeding is the issue, um, ATE cameras um, would be an example. Um, we don't really do um, speed humps on, uh, major streets, arterial streets, um, because of the emergency vehicles and, uh, bus service. Um, we'd want to, if the Hawk light is there, um, and functioning, I'd want to see, um, if there are other things like, so I'm <laughs> running through the Rolodex of treatments in my head, but if there are enough kids crossing, um, it may warrant changing the hawk light to a full color signal. That way more uh, people are familiar with that um, and, and they're more likely to stop um, if, it, if it's an uncontrolled crosswalk. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can go into it, uh, but I, I'd want to see the, the site myself. Um, Uh, thanks. And thank you, Carol, for your comment. Um, Marvin, I think you've had your hand up. If you want to go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a question. Um, well, a couple of questions. One was um, just clarifying the TSI process. If I understand correctly, this is a m method of you call in as a citizen to 311 if there's a specific traffic safety improvement that you would like to see. And then a ticket is created for that. Is that the correct sort of like process that I understand for this? Or is it separate for ANC members versus like the general public? So, sorry, I think I missed the question. Sorry about that. Can you repeat? Like just, yeah, a little bit. Um. Yeah, I was just wondering, is the purpose of TSI to create a process whereby citizens can request um, traffic safety improvements? And I guess one sort of thing is, is it based on, it sounds like there's, you know, priority based off of location to schools and stuff, but is it also based off of how many people are requesting a TSI or, okay. Yeah, sure answer is no, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, you just file a request with 311 for traffic safety improvement, correct? Yes, so main big difference between the previous system and the current one is that Previously, we only we process like first come first served, right? So if you uh submit, 
yeah, today, and then your request from tomorrow is going to be processed later, right? However, this time we have this quarterly system. So we have all those requests up to, to like for up to this quarter. And then we run this prioritization model. Uh, we can share the like link for the details. And then based on the existing conditions and data, so we literally rank every single intersections and top 200 most dangerous, like most unsafe ones will be prioritized that quarter. So that's why like how many requests, who requests doesn't really matter at this point, yeah. And then um, following up on that, I was wondering in terms of um, how requests are, so I guess in thinking about, um, sorry, the question just left me. Um, I'll come back in a minute once I finish it thinking through. Thank you so much. And I'll just say, you know, uh, having worked with the, the TSI team to establish this new process, this is an effort to make sure that uh, we are addressing the highest priority request locations and we're not just um, sort of doing a, a first come first serve. And it's it's resulting in us being more effective as DDOT and the neighborhoods that and locations that need it the most um, are getting uh, the focus. Um, so this is this is just an effort to be more equitable with uh, with how we're rolling things out. Thank you. I, I remembered the question. One was um, in the presentation you presented data on you know where there are um, you know high fatalities and where there's um, the most issues. Um, one thing I was wondering is the sort of flip side of that, um, where if there's any public data showing that when DDOT has installed these types of interventions, what reductions in, um, you know, incidents have occurred following the introduction of certain in um, interventions, thinking about, you know, everything from um, um, the pedestrian island, um, for pedestrians to protect bike lanes, to stuff like that, um, and showing how effective um, those interventions are. Because um, I feel as if that would be very useful as well um, in thinking about, um, you know, as a citizen advocating um, for safer streets in our area. Yeah, we. So we generally do a project evaluations, what we call them. Uh, we do the sort of project by project. So uh, Wheeler Road, for instance, we've got some good data uh, before we installed the speed cameras, um, then after we installed them, and then even looking at the, the citations after we installed the, uh, the road diet and the safety improvements. Um, so we've got good stories to tell on specific projects. Um, Citywide and kind of these like high injury um, intersections, um, we haven't sort of holistically gone through and said like, well, this location saw this many reductions. Uh, that's that's a program we're trying to stand up now or or an effort to include uh, that. We do know, like I said, we've got really good stories to tell on our quarter projects, um, intersection projects. It takes a little bit longer because if we're only relying on crash data crashes have to happen for us to know what did or didn't um, occur compared to previous um, years. And following up on that point, um, yeah, I was wondering in terms of thinking about the Complete Streets program, um, you mentioned Ward 8 only has bicycle facilities on trails. Um, I know there's a lot of people in the ward who do bike um, to get to work, to get to the grocery store. Um, I mean, I, I bike commute um, downtown um, and we're the only ward without any protected bike lanes. And so just thinking about that Complete Streets program, um, you know, what can be done to sort of advocate and get some of those facilities and award that desperately needs it. Um, <laughs> Kelly, do you want to take, I mean, this is, it's hard, right? There's, uh, there's a lot that goes into um, our plans. And I, I think 
one, a, a good solid trail network is comfortable for all road users and all, you know, bicycle levels of comfort. Um, and so a robust trail network is, is really important to getting people uh, to have those other options that are really safe and comfortable to use um, that get you to where you want to go. Um, in terms of uh, protected bike lane, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll, Kelly, I don't know if you want to share your thoughts. I mean, you're asking about like, like how we, yeah, I mean, can you just elaborate a question again about parts of bike lane? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I know, like, obviously, the elephant in the room is that the council member doesn't allow it. And I also, as a lawyer, I'm like, that's not legal. He's not the mayor of the ward. And so, like, there are people who are dying. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what can be done to sort of, you know, I, I really am excited about Vision Zero. I think it's a really great program. I think, you know, it saves lives. Um, and I also know that, like, unfortunately, we still have increasing traffic fatalities. Um, but I also wonder, you know, what can be done to sort of, you know, push the ball forward. So you mean, uh, especially it, with it, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it feels very, I mean, you know, well, we're recording, so I will keep it nice. It just feels very you know, frustrating that the city's blackest ward also has the least infrastructure for something that, um, you know, is of the great benefit for both health and safety. Um, and then also thinking about it, you know, I, I don't know if DDOT views protected bike lanes as shared mobility lanes, but, you know, I think about this for the fact that I live on a Fawila road. Um, I put in service requests to repair the sidewalk um, right in front of, I can't think of the, I, I think they just changed the name to maybe Crestview Gardens, um, the apartment complex that's right next door to Eagle Academy. Still not fixed. I see people who are on motorized um, wheelchairs who struggle over the routes off of that sidewalk all the time. When I get across the river, you know, I know people on motorized wheelchairs can easily use the protected bike lanes to get around in a way that is safe and easier, um, that is just not available in my ward, in addition to the fact that as a cyclist, I can't do so safely either. Um, and so I do think, you know, it's an equity issue. And I understand that one person doesn't like it, but it does feel very frustrating as a resident to see the ways in which we are being denied the same services that other wards are getting. And so just wondering, you know, how to, what are the sort of lever points in terms of these types of projects that are useful? Is it, you know, submitting TSIs? Um, you know, I think there's like small things that can be done, you know, for example, you know, um, there's no real good safe access as a cyclist to get to Anacostia Park, which is in our ward. Um, both Good Hope Road and Howard Avenue are the two main ways. I mean, there's Suitland Parkway. Um, but if you're coming from any of the neighborhoods of Anacostia or Congress Heights, um, you're generally not going to Suitland Parkway to get down to um, the park. And it feels a little bit frustrating that it's easy and safe to do so from Capitol Hill, um, but it's not easy and safe to do so within our own ward. And so like there's small little things like that that are, you know, up and available um, that I don't know if it's we need to, you know, start with those projects, um, but just thinking through like what are the sort of pressure points um, to get some of this infrastructure in our ward. Sure, thank you. I mean, I think the best way is to talk to your agency because, you know, as DDOT really uh, listen to like agency because they're representing. So if you, I mean, as a Redstone, you can talk to your your representative ANC that, you know, they understand, hey, your, I mean, their constituent, you are looking for more bike infrastructure, you know, and then that way, if that voice is more like bigger and then ANC may pass a resolution and we can receive, I mean, I, I I wouldn't comment on like council member, but definitely Dida, we have our planning, you know, team. And I think bike team's main like uh thing is the connection, right? 
uh, connecting existing bike infrastructure, right? So building just new bike lane out of nothing, that doesn't make sense, right? It's really about how we can connect existing bike lane and improve and, you know, upgrade. I agree. I, I think it's hard to connect when there's nothing. That's true. Yeah. So, so I think the first step is to really start to show that. Yeah. I mean, we love to yeah build more bike lanes throughout the district. You know, that's our goal, right? But I think we also at the same time we need to like strategically like thinking because let's say we have a very good vision of building something in War Day, but then we present that and then community say like, no, we don't want it. So I, it's just you know. So I think. To, to avoid that, we want to build some like trust and, you know, support a little bit. And then we uh, go into the community that that w works way better. So definitely we need your help for more support. And yeah. And also reach out to your council member. You know, that he's your council member. He needs to know that there are, you know, like eager bike supporters. So, so with the explicit sort of greater, greater Washington, which is a c4 organization is hosting this call and i'm going to say this and this is i am not saying this on behalf of anyone who works for the district department of transportation um you can vote your council member out and that's why we endorse people <laughs> so um you know that's why we endorse anc commissioners it's always great to see the commissioners that we've endorsed on um these calls and i think that's really valuable um your council members up for re-election next year. Um, I think that, you know, there's as, you know, as good as planning is, like politics is always a little bit more raw. And I think there's definitely a lot of space to talk about how to make access um, the the sort of fulcrum on which the conversation around transportation rests in more date rather than our bike lanes gentrification, um, which I think is is unfair and sort of short circuits a lot of things that are really valuable such as like preventing people from being killed or injured by drivers um so elections matter um you know i think we should definitely talk some more about that offline because i love talking to people offline about that uh and there's in sessions that are not recorded but one thing i do want to give a little bit of a press on to our ddot attendees here is that the Vision Zero Omnibus does provide for an installation mandate uh, for bus and bike lanes. So far, this is unfunded. Um, I would appreciate, with the note that like I, as the advocate here, can say that um, it might be wise to basically like lobby the council to uh, drop the uh, fiscal impact statement for that installation requirement, which is kind of a wonky like option, but I think could be a really interesting thing to do. Hypothetically, if the installation mandate were funded, <laughs> um, what would that look like in getting things installed that are in Move DC? Like, how would that actually work in practice if it were funded and actually moving forward? I think it's actually, I, I would welcome some insight on that here, hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically <laughs> speaking. Um, yeah, I think I I'm not familiar with that part of the omnibus bill. Um, we'll the code section in a second. Okay, um, I'd have to look at that, but I think it would just be part of our our process that we just fold in. Um, if we're mandated to do it, I think there'd be uh, hypothetically an NOI um, that went out. Um, maybe there's options for what it would look like um, that we can work through uh, with ANCs. Um, and then, yeah, it would just be part of the program. Um, I, I'm sure we'd need to staff up for that to make sure we have enough staff to cover um, all the streets that would then be added. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it would be more of a like regular part of the process. Yeah, so I think like reflecting back to some of the slides you had before about like how do projects get started and where do ideas come from? Like right now we don't have that sort of hook for like ostensibly things come from Move DC, but that can always go off the rails based on like political pressure um, and based on like public pressure also. So the I'm 
my computer like is super slow when I'm on video, but I will find this in a second. Um, but basically the Vision Zero Omnibus Bill um, does does include a re requirement to install bus and bike lanes if a street is under construction, which is similar to a policy that Cambridge, Massachusetts has. Um, it is right now, this is unfunded. And m an argument that I've made in some conversations recently for this year's budget is that I don't, it doesn't have to be funded because like beyond perhaps some full-time equivalents because these projects like the streets are going to get torn up anyway so if move dc says something is supposed to be on a street that's getting torn up for a repaving or a streetscape or something that it should be installed so this is again it's in the code but it isn't in practice yet because of this sort of it's hinging on being funded but getting that funded is both like challenging but also I would make the argument that it doesn't have to happen um so the point of that was to like because I worked on the vision zero bill was to get the council to give the administration a political cover when installing things <laughs> so that like you know it's easy to chalk this up on like bike lanes but we also lose bus lanes <laughs> to this which I think is kind of a travesty because of like especially like the the needs and access provided by the bus. So um so there are a couple of things that are that we just like have not stuck the landing on. You know, technically council manic prerogative doesn't exist in DC, like for what is worth, but like it does have an impact. I think like we can't ignore that. Like you're right. I don't want to say that like, oh yeah, it's totally fine. Your council member doesn't want stuff and that has no correlation with why there isn't stuff in your ward. Um but we can organize, we can vote in elections. And I think there's a little bit of a policy policy option here. We're trying to not make that installation mandate hinge on funding. So definitely like, let's talk more about that. Not just you, Marvin, but if that's of interest to anyone else in this call, and I'm going to go off video so I can actually pull up the code section. <laughs> In the meantime, any other questions? I guess on the Alabama, I know this is not a facility specific um, call, but just thinking about um, the bus priority, I know that was something that they're talking about on Alabama Avenue. Um, and I guess, um, in that sort of time frame, I'm just wondering, I know that one is in early sort of studies. Is this one where you think it is probably going to take a good five to 10 years for the complete street redesign? Or is the timeline on that a little bit shorter? So Alabama Avenue is a longer term study um, to do a complete streetscape. So this is looking at the entire public right of way that we have um, and what what we can do in terms of a redesign and what the community wants um, to come up with a, a good option in, in the different segments um, that address the issues that we have now and then build towards the future. Um, we are trying to uh, sort of mimic what we did on Wheeler Road and on Florida Avenue Northeast um, and, and do some interim um, safety treatments or multimodal improvements um, un until it's sort of under full construction. So as a result of that study, we're hoping to have some interim treatments that we can um, put on the street. Actually, I um, had a question that I just thought, how does DDOT work with WMATA in terms of moving bus stops? So just thinking about what you all said, there just, it seems like there is no enforcement um, particularly what I'm thinking of is there's a credit union and there's a bus stop outside of the credit union. No one, everyone parks in a bus lane. So when that bus turns the corner, it is legit impossible for the bus to move until people come from the credit union. And then generally there's just a lot of congestion. Is that something DDAS says, or maybe we just need to move this bus stop? Um, yeah. Is there a way around it? Absolutely. Two things, I mean, currently, if the cars are parked illegally so close to the like bus stop, 
it's mm. also parking enforcement issue. I mean, every Wamada stop has very clear no parking signs within the mm. zone because it's really for the safety of you know everybody, right? So that's a parking enforcement. If you see it, just uh submit three on one for parking enforcement, even if they may not come out like right away. All those data stays within like three on one data. People know uh, the government would know that oh this yeah this location is an issue. And then in the meantime, also you can reach out to us. We can we work. We are not Wamada, but we do work with Wamada just to you know share community concern. I mean, they may not say no, but we can definitely try and see what what uh feasible options they have. Okay. And just a plug for Wamada's uh, Better Bus, <laughs> they're doing a, a bus network redesign. Uh, I encourage you to, to look at the Better Bus um, website, see what service changes uh, they're proposing for your neighborhood, make comments on those lines. Um, and, and yeah, that that's really how they're going to get the input um, about you know what the future of the bus stop looks like, what the route is, and, and things like that. But we do, to Kelly's point, we do work with them on corridor projects uh, for moving bus stops. And that is a short-term uh, improvement that we can make. One other question on data, because I, I heard this come up in a meeting um, or in a discussion um, with other ANC members is, um, I was just wondering if there's any sort of data on the relationship between um, street installations um, and crime. Um, just in the sense of, um, you know, one of the things I've heard um, brought up is, for example, there are some communities I know you said the river requested speed humps, um, and now they want them removed due to the fact that cars are still speeding um, after, you know, committing some event, and then it's just causing more noise. But um, is there any sort of, you know, um, studies on the relationship between like permanent um, lane narrowing um, projects and the relationship you know, with crime um, as a result of that. I'm not sure if there's any data, but I mean, in terms of, you know, speed up request for any like uh, crime deter uh, deterrence. Yeah, we do receive those, but we, I think that that's a really, you, your point is absolutely right because we try to say, we understand, however, speed hump is not a crime deterrence, you know, mechanism, you know, this is really for the speeding and you're absolutely right. I mean, even if the speed hump is there, they continue to speed up and it, it's more dangerous. They, we, they may end up with like, you know, um, you know, hitting some parked car. So yes, we, that's why we really want to follow the TSI process to make sure we put speed hump where it's needed. So. And I'll say from a vision zero safe systems perspective, there are limitations, unfortunately, to design. I would love to be able to design everything super safely and um, and as much as we we can. And even if we do that, sometimes we still see people uh, with bad behavior um, acting poorly. Um, so that's where the other components of the safe system come into play. Um, so it's there is a limitation. I wish we could do more, <laughs> but um, yeah. We, we try and, and do as much as we can. I think just anecdotally, it is worth noting that like everyone can sense a sort of um, overlap between like like dri driving in itself can be violent and, and that like more visibility, expanding sidewalks, like expanding curbs, slowing things down is just like, a generally good practice overall, right? It's it's hard to define. Like it's it's really hard to define like transportation and public health in some ways. There's a bunch of research, a lot of it's qualitative, like we don't have a perfect like narrative, but I do think that's part of it, right? I mean, I it was important for me for me to get speed humps on my street last year, which happened, which was not a guarantee. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of work from our ANC. Um, and like, I think there's just been a value to the street feeling like generally calmer um, that has like paid dividends in ways that we won't actually know. We won't be able to analyze that. And I think like 
that alone is a is a deterrent. There's also like noise pollution is really bad and traffic calming <laughs> can, can help considerably with um noise, which is kind of one of the secondary or second most, I think, like second greatest impact of like the public health effects of of cars is is second to sort of the fatalities that they cause is also noise, um, which I think helps considerably with just like the general sort of environment and trying to calm things down, make things more accessible, have things a little bit more clear as to what is happening and legible for people in their own neighborhoods and their own space. So it's my very woo-woo like statement on like, I do think these things are interrelated, even if there isn't exactly the data to back them up. And I think people can sense that, which is probably why you asked that question. <laughs> yeah, we don't do decibel counts before and after, but uh, I actually in Alexandria, I worked for Alexandria, the city of Alexandria for a few years. And I put in speed feedback signs on Beauregard, which is a major street. People speed a lot on it because there's a lot of slope to it. Um, and maybe like the week that we installed those speed feedback signs, it slowed people down. And I got a message from a constituent um, or a resident um who said i can finally open my window now because it's not so loud from people speeding um so yeah that's people complain about the sound and the noise of speed humps but i, I think you're right there is a um the slower speeds help yeah and I, I was i was asking also because i was thinking of this study that looked at perceptions of crime and um, where people feel safest. And it was thinking about like installation of, you know, protective bike lanes as a way of creating a feeling of safety. Um, and was wondering if there's, you know, if you've not seen any sort of data backing up similar sort of studies. Granted, this study, I believe, was just based off of um, data on perceptions rather than um, actual sort of um, how things happen, but, um, you know, just thinking about do, you know, I, I do think, I will say the installations on Wheeler Road have been great in terms of, you know, um, slowing cars down. Now, do cars still speed down Wheeler Road occasionally? Yeah, they do. And, uh, <laughs> it's still, you know, a problem. But overall, I can say, you know, as a pedestrian who takes a bus, I take the A6 all the time um, to Anacostia, like I can cross the road now very safely in a way that I could not do um, before. And so I think that's pretty amazing. And so, yeah, just wondering how that, um, if there's any sort of, you know, data that the agency has seen related to that. I haven't seen this study that you mentioned, uh, but I'm not speaking for every one of us, um, but I'll, I'll take a look. Um, yeah, this looks inter really interesting. I actually just have two things and I have to pop off. I um, promised the constituent I was speaking to this evening. I'm at 7.30. Um, so second, Marvin, me and Marvin actually were talking about this a few weeks ago. And so thank you for bringing it up, Marvin. I think it will be, good for DDI and it's just an idea, but to pay attention to that because that could be a benefit for certain council members or certain people in the community who don't support Vision Zero and some of these um, infrastructure changes that it may be that it does reduce crime from the perspective of um, drive-bys, escaping uh, the police after a shooting, going down streets that are hard to get through because it just makes it for a hard getaway. And so those are valid reasons, not that I'm a criminal, but just put myself in a mindset of a certain culture that I live and grew up in that does impact it. Now, of course, I don't have any numbers or studies, but it's just something for DDOT to look into. I think Wheeler in Mississippi would have been perfect because that is often a uh, a way and when there's a shooting that people go down those streets to get away and i would be curious to see once all that stuff came up did that change or something like that so just something to think about and then the last thing is it would be good for d dot to come into the community like on a front lines kind of basis like foot patrol because all these issues are in ward eight but yeah we're li we're least likely to report and i think a lot of that has to do with how people perceive 311, like who to use it, 
Uh, also, some people don't take it, they don't prioritize it because we have so many other issues, all right? Affordable housing, crime, we, who has time to report, you know, um, a sidewalk issue. And so I think if the more people get involved and you hear from people, we kind of get like a better idea of how to best, because um, Ward A is just unique to the rest of the city with a lot of things. And it should be treated and handled a little differently than other places just because of everything that's going on. So it'd be nice to see DDOT come out into the community like on the summer. Um, the better bus thing I went to when I guess like two weeks ago. And it was to me such a low turnout. A lot of people did not hear it. And I'm not sure why ANCs didn't share it as much. I think it got mixed up in the email and Chisholm sit out. It just wasn't a separate email, so a lot of us missed it. But something like that would be amazing if we can get a lot of Ward 8 residents out to understand through and one of the process and the importance of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, the crime prevention, so big picture speaking, um, I think this is that's a really great point. And uh, we, the mayor has promised a Vision Zero top to bottom redo um, starting in FY24 or in F by 24. Um, so next year. Um, and these are the conversations that we want to have with communities to learn what are ways that we can um, improve traffic safety and meet more needs. Um, so happy to, to hear that and would love to have that strategy sort of be part of, of what we look at. Um, in terms of like getting out in the community, Right now we've done, and Kelly can speak more to, to sort of regular opportunities, uh, but as part of Good Hope Road and these uh, key safety corridors, we're trying to do road safety audits, which are uh, community and agency and multidisciplinary walks uh, along the street to see like what the conditions are in the morning, in the afternoon, uh, overnight, we drive it. And, and that's why we need input from residents to know what are the issues that we may not be seeing that happen a lot that just aren't in the couple hours that we're out there in the morning and evening for the, the road safety. So love to have more participation in those. We got a, a pretty a pretty low turnout for a good hope. Um, not none, but yeah, I would have loved to see more folks. Yeah, just to add a little bit, if you wanna like schedule a quick site visit, a commissioner, you can reach out to Sierra. We can definitely do that. And also for like sidewalk and roadway, Ellie, we do have a team to like inspect the entire district like annually. So they come up with the index for the condition index for like sidewalk, road, alley. So, but then still, you know, there are maybe some emergency sidewalk issues. You can always reach out to like us with some photos. We can maybe do like spot treatment for the emergency to make sure the it's like safe to pass. Um, it is 7.30. <laughs> like the same thing when we did this last week where I was like super surprised. Um, this was really great. Does anyone else have any questions in sort of our remaining few minutes? Cool. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, like I said, this was recorded, so I'll send around the link to it. Um, and uh, feel free to circulate it. Um, so if you have any questions, definitely reach out to Christine or Kelly, but also feel free to reach out to me um, and I'll see what I can do to help, uh, you know, talk to the agency about agency stuff and talk to me about political stuff. Do not talk to the agency about political stuff. That's not their job. <laughs> um, but I uh, look forward to continuing our conversations. Um, I'll also share a general session if you didn't get the link for that. And the remaining sessions are in uh, words five and seven. Um, but if you're interested, feel free to just listen in on those. It'll be more of the same, but in different words, but it could be valuable. So um, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. And thank you, DDOT. Um, and enjoy your evening. Go outside. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Good night. everyone. Good night. Thank you.